Happy New Year from 11 Personnel, presented by Monticello Bank. I'm Nick Roush. He's Adam Luckett. Luckett just couldn't quit the Gator Bowl. He's still down in Jacksonville, um, where I'm sure it's balmy. There are just beautiful women everywhere. It's uh, 90 degrees. I'm sure you've golfed every day. Maybe shooting in the 70s, right? Just perfect, perfect trip. I wouldn't say that. Drink, drink some cold beers down here. Um, didn't do much. Didn't do any golfing. Um, surprisingly. Wow. No watch, wa- watch a lot of football. Um, just took it easy, really. And so now we're. As soon as we get done recording this, we are hitting the road. But got to give the people what they want, which is a new episode of Eleven Personnel, because there is. Um, I feel kind of. I've almost felt bad taking a few days off because I feel like there's stuff we need to talk about. Um, even though it's kind of quiet right now, uh, but there is some big topics out there. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things too, that part of me, um, it's the post new year's, uh, sadness, you know, the yes. ball season's yeah. over. Christmas that hit me is last over. night. Yeah. And like, th- there's just not games all the time. So like I could distract myself from the Kentucky loss with football and now it's kind of gone and we just got to sit here and talk about a season that was below expectations and then a disappointing end in the Gator Bowl. Um, so it, it's kind of a bummer. But one thing we are excited about, though, Monticello Bank, uh, we appreciate their support over 2023. They're going to be back in 2024. Um, all the fun we have, all the stuff we do, we, we couldn't do it without our friends at Monticello Bank. So big thank you um, to Monticello Bank. Remember, that it's where people matter. Right, Peak? It's where people matter. Well, hello, Cindy. A lot of banks are changing hands these days. Not Monticello. We've been building relationships since 1895. And with each passing year, we've grown. Hello, Cindy. Hi. And expanded our services to meet the needs of the communities we serve. Aren't you forgetting something? Monticello Bank, equal housing lender, member FDIC. Love that. You got to get the dumb, dumb sucker when you go to Monticello (laughs) Bank. I mean, there you go. It's, it's better than a uh, trip to the doctor. The, those suckers, too, are better than the um, the, the ones with the little loop, you know what I'm talking about? The circle the ones. Doctor. Yeah. Yeah, those sucked. Dum Dum's great, just like Monticello Bank. Great. Great to have them on board again, 128 years in business. They're simply the best. Um, but the Gator Bowl wasn't the best. And, and, and really, the longer – I got – I, the further we get away from the game, the more angry I get about it. Because I like in the moment, like it, that was an awesome football game. I, you know, we had the adrenaline rushing. Um, like it, it was things were happening fast. Now it just sucks because all you have to do is just talk about their shortcomings, and it's not fun to talk about. It's not fun to talk about with you. It's not fun to talk about with our fans on the board. It's just like it sucks. I, I, I don't have a good way to put it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's kind of tricky because we a lot of times we're making like big picture declarations off of a sixty minute what it's a kind of an exhibition game uh, in bowl season. Things get weird in bowls. We've talked about this, so you don't want to you don't want to just you know be super short sighted uh, with all of this. But I just look at it this way, Nick, like. I don't think they're super far off. I still think they've kind of got top 25 roster and talent, but they don't have those results the last two years. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, the frustrating part in all of this. There have been some, I think, roster shortcomings that that have come and bit them in the ass the last two years. Um, Offensive line, you know, the kicking game woes showed up again. Uh, late, late in this year, and the, uh, I think, I think the transfers they took and the, the, they weren't ready to play for whatever reason at corner, uh, and so that that really I think stung them late, late in this year, late in the year, and that's why I think they've lost a couple of games, um, and then you look at fifty fifty games. You are what your, you know, Bill Parr says you are what your record record says you are. I think in college football, you are what your 50-50 record says you are. Uh, because that's that's where most people are living in this sport outside of 
Um, the elites. It's what you do in close games, and even the elites have to win a couple. But other teams are in a lot more of them. Mm-hmm. Kentucky just fell short in yeah. spots, you know, and that's over the last, I think, over the last two years in a lot of ways. Well, uh, and if you go back three years, because – I think a lot of what we're living in right now is the how what's Kentucky's formula winning formula post Grand Era. It was pretty concrete, right? Like they developed an identity, yeah. Run the damn ball, keep everything in front, play solid defense, and in that time since you're 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 slowly going away from that, and you're trying to figure out who you are, what you are, and in that 2021 year. I mean, outside of the Tennessee game, I think they won every close game, right? Or if, if mm-hmm. I, I mean, I, I guess a lot of those games kind of turned into blowouts a little bit. I know the Florida game wasn't. They needed to go on stand down there, an interception from Jacquez Jones at the end. But since then, the, the, the close games have not gone Kentucky's way. And I think a lot of it is because that winning formula is changing. Look, it, this was before uh, you started with KSR, but – I swear, I think I wrote seven, 17 is a conservative estimate of articles I wrote in the offseason about Kentucky getting more explosive. We finally got Kentucky more explosive, and now you're like, well, where, where's the efficiency at, right? Because that was, I mean, that was, a, we had, that was the most explosive game since, what, Louisville in 17, maybe, where it's just, Big play touchdown, big play touchdown, and they had yeah, some I mean, of like those. a close game. I would say they they've had some in blowouts where they, right. but mainly against Louisville. But and yeah. even like in their shootouts, like the, the Tennessee game or the Ole Miss games, like they were a little bit more methodical. Um, they were kind of like what Clemson did, where you're you're getting seven and eight plays. Down. Like, dude, this was just like seventy yards, sixty yards, forty yards, thirty. I mean, it was that was a bonanza. Um, but it's it's not. It, I don't want to say they threw out the baby with the bathwater, but it's almost like um, you're trying to build the plane as it's flying. And, hell, we used this analogy earlier in the year. Clark Griswold, Vegas vacation, Hoover Dam, you know. Like, they, they did plug one hole, but then what you thought was good has kind of gone away from it. So we're kind of th- – that's what it's felt like um, for a lot of the last two years where you're you're starting to get some – you're finally getting some good receiver play, right? But then, like, the other stuff kind of goes by the wayside. And that's, that's I think, where this program is, is, well, you're, you're seeing a willingness to adapt, a willingness to evolve, a willingness to adjust, which, you know, when we get to some of these specific talking points, I know people are going to be fired up about. So you're seeing a willingness to adapt, a willingness to get high-quality players from the portal, uh, but just the whole puzzle hasn't been put together. And I, I think that's really – Mark Stoops' biggest offseason question is, where's our happy medium between these two extremes? I think a lot of this just comes down to the trench play. I think for a long time, you give Kentucky a 21-10 lead, they're winning the football game. Because uh, they're going to be able to grind out first downs. That was this offense's biggest issue all season. They just could not grind out first downs. The street I mean, all, and the weakness. Even their scoring drives for four or five plays long. I mean, it's just like boom, boom, back on the field. Mm-hmm. And so defensively, structurally, and how they play, Kentucky has an organization that's built to kind of protect the defense. And the offense and the special teams are not protecting uh, the defense right now. And I think overall that's probably the biggest, I wouldn't say red flag, but the biggest concern right now is – stylistically how you play you know you want to play this big play prevention defense um keep everybody in front you really can't really play like that if they're getting the ball at midfield uh, a lot you know you're not flipping the field at all punt punting wise I mean, you're not able to churn out you know first downs just to keep the other offense off the field after a long drive not playing complimentary football and so, like, they have to figure out what they have to do to get back to it. I mean, I go back to the line play because um, Liam Cohen said after the game, you know, we got to be able to run it. Um, to me, that's on the line. Like, we got to be able to create some running room, even against big, you know, heavy boxes. We at least got to get three or four yards. Well, and I think that's you know, concerning. It, go and ahead. You, you, you don't have to – I think that's an offseason um, thing you can work on too, like – 
you don't have to have just the biggest maulers out there to create running lanes. That's that's what Kentucky yes. did for the longest time. But like, you can be smaller and still find ways to create running lanes. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Plenty of teams which, do it. <laughs> which is something. I think to look at and even go back to Cohen's pre Louisville comments. He talked about that. What do we have to do to basically modernize our offense? What spread stuff do we have to look at? And I think that's part of it. I think you're right. I think getting out of those condensed formations mm-hmm. is something they're really going to have to look at. And Especially then how does that affect your receivers? You know? How does that affect your tight end usage? And all of that they're going to have to, I think, mm-hmm. look at. And then, um, but I, I, I still think it goes down to the line, line play. Nick, they got four, they got three scholarship tackles on the team next year. They're just not recruiting well enough on the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Uh, they're becoming the, very – go ahead. Like, it, I forgot what game it was when the secondary was struggling and we're like, we'll just look at the recruiting rankings. Eli Cox was like the lowest – I mean, he's he's been a good player, but like you're expecting this like – the lowest guy in your class to be your four-year captain star, you know, like you just kind of go through the line. And I think that it was Ford, the highest ranked recruiter recruit in that whole bunch. And he didn't even play this year. I would a Jagger. Oh, Jagger. Okay. Yeah. All right. Glossed over him, but yeah. But you, yes, you need, yes. You know, like that's, that's part of it. Lane and young and Darren Kennard. Those are big recruiting wins and they, they panned out. Yeah. Line play is unique because there's definitely, Definitely more random three stars hit there mm-hmm. than a lot of other positions, and a lot of top one hundred and fifty guys bust just because it's a hard position I think to evaluate and you know develop and all of that. But they're just not like they're just not they're just not doing doing it well enough in recruiting. So what they're creating what they're creating is it's a punt on high school and it's trying to build this through the portal and I just that's not. Like, you can build, I think, baseline level lines where you're not terrible. A line like this year, which I don't think they were bad, but they definitely weren't good. Um, And so you can get by with that, but in big moments and big games, it's going to show up that you just can't block the other team. And I think that showed up against Clemson. And then I think they had a lot of variety in the run game, Nick. And I think you got to credit Cohen. Yeah. Um, But eventually they – they put everything on tape and people just figured it out, um, what they were yeah. doing. I think there is schematic wrinkles that you can do to hide some stuff, but yeah. they've got it in, a, in the run game. To me, they got to figure out, all right, we're running this to hell or high water, this concept. This is what we're going to be good at. This is what we're going to take to the bank. I think maybe there was too much spread and spray in the board. Right. Maybe they need to get good at one thing, and that's how you develop an identity and – player and yeah. going on the line because with you know well, the other they ran once they ran inside zone i mean they were going to run it on your ass and there was you know most teams yeah. they, except georgia they were able to run it and run it efficiently and effectively well, now they can't really do that at all and they've got they've got all these different type of run game uh run game variety which i, I think is a credit to cohen that they were able to figure some stuff out but i think we saw in the last four or five weeks that people just figured them out in the run game and, and then it goes back to, I, I think, what made his job hard this fall is that you would have, I think it was game four, pin and pull, they're kicking all kinds of ass, and then week six, they can't, they, they're getting tackled for loss every time they try to run pin and pull. Like, the dudes are just chasing them down the line of scrimmage. They can't even, can't even get the running back to the line of scrimmage for he's tackled behind. It was just kind of a, once you thought you had, this was you're going to be your bread and butter, it got, it got taken away. Um and, and as much as we spent time here talking about the running game's problems, a lot of it flows back on the quarterback play. A lot of it. I mean, you, you uh, above average quarterback play can erase a lot of those woes, and Kentucky did not get that this year. You thought that that would be the form, and Leary was fine, but like they needed better than fine. He was going to take them as far as they would go. Um, he completed 57% of his passes against Clemson. That was r- above his average for the year in the SEC play. 57% is not good, you know? And I think 130 of those yards came on two plays, if I'm not mistaken. So 130 of his 300. Two plays accounted for half of his production. He did have – but, like, that. that's not to take away from some of the good stuff he did, some of the nice throws, 
you know, like the the Danky touchdown against the Louisville, the final drive against the Louisville that Darty delivers to Barry on, right? Like he found those guys that were open against Clemson, but he also had three fourth quarter turnovers, and I'm including the last one too because Kentucky still had three timeouts. They had an open guy at like the 45 or so. I mean, he and he just sails it over the dude's head. Um, how many tip? If it, I haven't done the numbers yet, Luckett. But there was that one point of the year where I think half of his passes were either dropped or tipped at the line of scrimmage. And yeah. some of that's on him, right? So um, you, you, you have to have better quarterback play than what they got this year. Then they, they did not get a good uh, rate of return. I, I think that's just plain and simple. Yeah, I think you look back at Devin Leary's season. Like, he was <laughs> – like you could make the argument he was probably the second best quarterback in the Stoops era. I think it's probably him or Steven Johnson. And that's it's not necessarily a great thing, but yeah. it's not terrible. He was fine. He was good. I think what you're getting at is right. They what what they had invested in him was they were expecting more. And I think Correct. Dad had a lot. They, in a lot of ways, the offense was kind of planning to be built, built around yeah. him, mm-hmm. and it came short of expectations, and that. And I think they were handcuffed in some ways with him at quarterback, notably tip balls at the line, no QB run element at all. Correct. Yep. Now, with that said, I thought he did a good job of, like, sack avoidance. Uh, yeah. They could have been a lot more sacks. I think he avoided uh, – he did a good job of kind of getting the ball out a lot of times where even a guy like Levis, those are sacks against him. Mm-hmm. Um like that touchdown so he had to Ray, where Ray just kind of goes all over the field. Right? Yeah, Great yeah. Play. And just uh, he did it against you know better teams too. I mean that was an all year type thing. Mississippi State I think was probably the best of that. He got out of three or four sacks in that ball game and really kind of extended plays and didn't let any Mississippi State get any momentum. But overall, I think disappointing year. And what what I go back to like it is a conversation we had on here when we were talking quarterback pecking order and stuff like that. We would have lost a significant amount of money. You just never know. Just betting on Leary to be better than Brady Cook. Who in this world would have thought Brady Cook would have outplayed Devin Leary this year? I mean, I you know I could see like when we're doing the KJ Jefferson or Spencer Rattler, and you're trying to, but Brady Cook is one where I just like never in my wildest dreams would I've envisioned him having the. I thought that was the kind of year that Leary was going to have. I'm glad you bring that up. Because uh, here's a lesson I think we all should pull um, from this. You need to have star power. Brady Cook had an All-American running back and a five-star receiver who was going to win the Bolitnikoff six or seven games in the year, and then he slowed down. Mm-hmm. They had just two dudes to go to, right, that could carry the – there were engines in that offense. D.O. Weiss was pretty, pretty great, too. D.O. Weiss was a good yeah. third option for that yeah. – for Missouri, and then Cook's legs. That's where with, I think, Kentucky, like we kind of saw this in 2021. They had the engines, right, with Chris Rodriguez, mm-hmm. Wondell Robinson, and that's why they were able to score points. I think Kentucky this year, they, on paper, looked like they had the engines, but it was a little inconsistent, mainly at wide receiver. Yeah, well, sophomore slumpage. And Ray Davis was an all. He did a lot of good things, but he was very boomer bust with him, mm-hmm. unfortunately. Uh, but I will say this: I say that with the star power. The one thing I think Liam Cohen does, and I think it might be his biggest strength as a play caller, is if he gets the horses, they've got feed in their troughs nonstop. They are <laughs> getting the football. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm not saying Liam Cohen's ever going to coach a Heisman Trophy winner. But if he's got a guy in the running, that dude is getting the Brock, and they're going to try to get him touchdowns. Uh, and it's he, I think he gets a lot of that from Mark Whipple because that's how Mark Whipple was. Um, you go back and look at the year he had with Pitt, with Kenny Pickett and Jordan Addison. Yeah. Kenny Pickett was throwing it, and Addison was getting the ball, and they, they weren't running it. Those were their two guys, and that's what they – and they won an ACC title, Pitt did that way because they had two pros. And so for Kentucky, it's getting the pros <laughs> – if they get that, I think they can find they, – they can ride them. Um, now, you look at Barry and Brown, Nick. Yeah. He played – he had his best game of his career, I think, in that Gator Bowl. Like, I thought yeah. he was awesome in that game. 
It, and it's a shame, too, that you had the – I mean, he had two 20-plus yard runs, too, and one, I mean, that one game called back. He was a game tilter. Yeah. Um, Clemson just – they couldn't handle him. I mean, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, the kickoff return, and then he gets I, – I haven't seen the all-22 angle of that, but I would assume he just blisters by the safety – on that mm-hmm. post, like, like that's that's what you you see it with, and that's the frustrating I think I think with Barium, mm-hmm. is because you see stuff like that, and it's like if he can ever figure it out, like this dude is gonna be unstoppable. And so, how can you pull that out of him for a full season? I think that's the big question because you get that, and then you team it up with a Dane Key as a really good, you know, number two. Like that, that could be something. I mean, if you can find a good running back again, that could be something. But you yeah. gotta, you gotta do, you gotta like, you have to. All those things have to happen together. It's like playing golf. Like if you hit a good tee shot, it doesn't matter unless you hit a good oh. approach shot. Dude, you know, uh, yeah. And so you gotta, you gotta like, align them. You gotta stack them. And so in one season, and that's I think what they need to focus on right now. If they could get that, then you could see it. But that's the thing with Barry and Brown. I know people a lot of frustrate are frustrated with him, but that guy in that Gator Bowl. I mean, that's a potential All American. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is right. if it comes together for him. Like Consistently, that, it's just, if he yeah. can, if he can hit the drive, he can hit the drive that puts you fifty yards from the cup. But there's too many uh, can't get on the green and then three putts for bogey, or then yeah, gets I mean, on the green and then three putts for bogey. It's it's basically my golf game, right? Like let's hits your gap, see- hits the gap wedge ninety yards. Yeah, exactly. And then you're over there in the trees. <laughs> yep, yep. And yeah. then you two more shots, and you get on, and then you bury a long putt, and you're like, "What the hell is this? Like, I, yeah. how can I not just get on? I'm right there. There's nothing in front of me, but I top my way. You know, it's awful. That that's a, I love that comp because a lot of it for this offense moving forward is the consistency, um, and you know they're bringing another guy too that was a high volume guy in Jamori Macklin that has the explosiveness, um, but. We'll see about the consistency, right? And that that's going to be the name of the game <laughs> yeah, this off yeah. season. Uh, for and that's why I bring in Dakiel Shorts, right? Because like I, he, that's kind of what he was as a player. You know, he wasn't the most explosive uh, guy, but he was he was Mister Steady Eddie for West Virginia. He turned Tank Dell into a tank, uh, and they're hoping he can do more of that next fall um, in Lexington. I want to I want to switch gears to the defense like it because. Third and 18 has been kind of talked to uh, till we're blue in the face. And even more so, soft zone. Bum, bum, bum. And uh, here, here's the other thing, too. I think it's completely unfair to just call it soft zone. Like, it's cover three or, like, quarters instead of cover two where you're jamming up front. And I don't – cover two kind of sucks at the college level. There's, like, huge holes there. I don't really like cover two. Um, I'm not exactly – it looked like they were in a cover three or four for that – third and 18 but we don't get the all 22 angle so look it i i i've talked about it an extent i i got on my sword like john snow um i was willing to fall on it to say like hey the third and 18 didn't cost him the game i actually think it was the right call wrong execution in most third and longs especially with the game on the line like yes play just keep everything underneath i, I think most defensive coordinators would call it that way in that scenario they just didn't execute. Corner bailed out. The nickel was, like, covering the flat. Like, it was the first down marker. Um, but generally speaking, like it, is there – is Kentucky's zone defense uh, a problem? Is this philosophy – because that's what it's coming down to, right, is this overall philosophy that it hasn't worked. But I call bullshit because I've never seen Kentucky defenses in my lifetime better than this. So, like – that, that's the part of it that's frustrating. Is like, how many times have you watched Kentucky football play a game where they hit eight sacks? Maybe twice in your life, you know? So, like, that's the part of this that there's a huge disconnect that people are letting one play and um, an apprehension to, to like, people just want to be aggressive, right? They want to go down swinging. But this style has given us the best Kentucky defense of my life. So, like, I'm not – I, I – there's obviously problems here, but I, I think there's been a huge overreaction to one drive as to like the overall offensive philosophy of this program, or excuse me, defensive philosophy of this program. I think it can still work, generally speaking, um, but I, I, 
that doesn't need to say that there needs to be no changes at all, right? Like, I, I just I just think there's one big overreaction to one bad drive after Kentucky played great defense all day. Yeah, I do think if Maxwell Harrison and Andrew Phillips don't get hurt, I think the game looks different, but that's football. Mm-hmm. So you have to go with that. Um, Nick, to me, it necessarily wasn't one play. I mean, they were protecting Jordan Robinson – they, Jansen Dunn probably needed to get more depth there, as you alluded to. Um, so, you had players in there that hadn't really played all year. So, I mean, that that it is what it is. It's just it's one one play. Anything can happen in one play, right? Mm-hmm. We've seen over yeah. time. My bigger problem is the coverage stunk all year. I mean, it just stunk. They would give up high completion percentage all season. They it was a poor tackling unit. It was a poor tackling unit, I thought. Um, you've got, outside of Hairston and Phillips, you really had no corners really step up really all year. Um, safety play was highly, highly disappointing, I think, for most of the year. I think it got turned around a little bit the last couple games, I think mainly because of Zion Childress, and I thought Jordan Lovett played good in the bowl game. Um, but safety play was disappointment. So, all those culminated in guys had to play that you really didn't expect or maybe wanted on the field. Like Ty Bryant played a ton. It's a true freshman. He wasn't playing in the last two games for a reason, right? Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it was out of necessity that they had to play him. And then I think, you know, Jordan Robinson was a Division two corner with size. It just hasn't hit mm-hmm. uh, for whatever reason. I think a lot was riding on J.Q. Hardaway. I think you go back and listen to some of our offseason. It's like they really need this guy to step up. That didn't happen in year one mm-hmm. for him. Now, he's still got a lot of potential, I think, to grow into something. Um, so they were they were just in a tough spot, I think, at corner all year. Uh, and I think you have to – like you, they added three corners or three transfers over a two-year cycle. Why were those the three they added, I think, is a fair criticism with – like you got to get something out of one of those three in that in that year you just had, and that you really didn't is unfortunate. You know, and, and like they're spending I mean, scholarship. That, that's, just a, that's a failure in coaching. Like you have to have a. Not all of them are going to be hits, but like one of them has to be able well, to play th- this year. I think it's. Of, I mean, I think it's from scouting to evaluating to scholarship management to all of that. I think to developing. Yeah, like it's all yeah. all of the above. Like you need to have. Harrington Valentine put them in a pinch, right? They didn't yes, expect that. Yes. But but now how do you well, how do you recover? They're getting in another pinch right here because Drew Phillips leaves. Yeah. So you get another 50-50 draft player or draft stay guy who's gone, and that puts you, you know, in a pinch. And then you you feel really good, I think, about Harrison. And then I think we're gonna talk ourselves into these safeties again. Um so you feel good, and then I, there's good balance in the room, but you've got to have some guy step up here. Uh, so to me, that is the biggest issue, that that the secondary just was what it was all year. we got two full-time coaches over there. Mark Stoops, the, you know, got a deep Third, secondary background. Right. And that, that was, to me, that was the biggest problem with the defense. Like, the front seven was pretty good. And they, they, they showed this improvement, year. I think, throughout the year, too. Yeah. Um, and they, there's a lot, I think, to get excited about with that defensive front yeah. and that front seven with Jamie Dumas Johnson coming in. Um, especially if that's the we, the Weaver we saw the last two weeks. If that's the Weaver next year, that, that gets you a little excited. And then you saw some, I think, some of the juice from some of these younger guys, specifically Tyree Sphere, as a pass rusher. Yeah. He had like, a best that, game. Like, that's exciting. But and that's right when you, you want the light bulb to, to turn on the end of his second yeah. year, right? Like and then you look at the just look at the quarterbacks they're going to play, man. Jackson Dart, um, Quinn Ewers, Carson Beck. Mm-hmm. You know they're going to play some good. That's just off the top of my head. Um, Nico, uh, they're going to play Graham Mertz. They're going to play some good quarterbacks here this next season. So they're going to have to be able to cover. A lot better than they did this year. Like the pass defense was, just, it was not good this year, Nick. It, any any team that wanted to complete an eight yard pass, it felt like they could have done it on any play against them. Mm-hmm. You know, 
So you have to figure out, is it, is it right. scheme? Is it personnel? Is it a little bit of both? I think it's probably a little bit of both. So they have to figure out what's going to be the best mode of operation. And I also think, like I've been wondering this myself, Matt House got annihilated this year at LSU. Mm-hmm. So why did that happen? Like now they're running, they're a different scheme because they're running a lot more man um, than Kentucky is. But why is there something with how they kind of designed the defense that didn't work for? Because you know Matt House came from Kentucky, so how much? What are the similarities here? But I found that well, interesting that they both had kind of bad, unexpected years. I I, I do think a lot of the this type of defensive success is predicated on. A Mike Edwards, Kyle Hamilton type, like just this kind of hybrid safety that can play up and back and really operates well um, in zones, just has a good feel for it, and that feel is unteachable, right? Like you just have to. Well, I think you go back to Keetron Smith. I think with him, he was really he was a really good zone cornerback. Yeah, just got a um, great had a feel. good feel and awareness. Mm-hmm. Good tackler. I get the sense that they those they don't have that right now, so it's kind of. Figure it it's out tough. on the fly, but well, they have to figure something out, Nick. Because like their offense let them down in a lot of ways, in special teams they were put in some tough situations. But I mean, they the they were the reason the field. You know. They were the reason they lost the Tennessee game. The defense mm-hmm. again, and and not just that game too, but you had all of these third and long situations where it's like, all right, the front South Carolina is a perfect example. Yeah, the front sevens doing their job, and then on the money down. They have to get home, or you're not getting off the field. Yeah, well, that's of, the thing. Like, like, if drop eight's not working, you need to just. And that would be my next question. Third long, like, let them th- throw it short, and so we can play four deep and come up and tackle them. If that's what you need to do, that that would be better than what they were they were doing. Is maybe you put send a five or six heating up the quarterback and making that ball get out. So is is that the. That's like the obvious answer, right? But like probably not a good long-term one for next year is I think part of it is finding some personnel. But if all goes to hell in a handbasket, you just you go third and grant them well, on their ass, right? And yeah, just like... but that's that's the, <laughs> that's the problem with the issue because in 2022 they were great in drop eight. And so and this year they're not. So, you know, I, I feel like this year, Nick, there was a lot of – it felt like the coaches just didn't maybe have a great handle for what the team was. What they could um, do, what they were capable of. That's what it felt like to me. I could be wrong on that, but it just felt like there was just something missing there. Like you just didn't have a full kind of grasp for what the team could do and what their what the best call for that personnel was. Maybe, like you're right, when they ran drop eight a bunch and it just didn't work all year, <laughs> maybe – some point, try to change some things, and I think we did see some changes. Like you saw more pressures from Kentucky mm-hmm. in that game. Um, like really, we saw corner pressure that got home for really the first time all year. I thought um, yep. Harrison forced an incompletion on third down. Chance and Dunn got a sack. Mm-hmm. And so, what is you know? So what? Did, maybe that's something they look at moving forward. But I, I just. I don't know. It was a frustrating year defensively because I don't think they're bad on defense, but the pass defense was bad. Yeah, and yeah. it looks bad when you play some good quarterbacks and some good passing games. Uh, and so you look back at the season in the games that people care about, like you get roasted against Georgia and Alabama. Absolutely roasted. Uh, but you also can't stop Missouri. You also can't stop Tennessee. And you can't stop Clemson in the fourth quarter of any of those games. Now, M- Missouri and Clemson, the offense and special teams kept screwing you over uh, mm-hmm. with field position. But, you know, there's some other there's some other data points, too, that say even if they didn't, they, maybe you couldn't have stopped them either. Uh, right, so that right. is concerning. But to, to end kind of on an optimistic note, this front seven is going to kick all kinds of ass next year. I mean – Yeah, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> I mean, the, the way Dion played in that And they have depth, game, too, man. Yeah, like it just across the board. I mean, I know Dion's going to take a lot of the shine, but we we mentioned Fearbury having a great game, giving some bend on that edge. Uh, JJ playing Sam, like you even got Ox winning some one on ones, and that's that's kind of like what the that's the best form of pass rush, right? Is whenever guys take up a lot of space, and then you know another one sneaks in there, makes a big play. 
Um, like you yeah. see it in the NFL all the time. Like watching Zadarius Smith still be productive this year. Like shout out Miles Garrett. <laughs> you know, like I mean, right. that's, you know, like that. That's how this works. I mean, what, Boogie Gravity. Watson. The, the way that his 2018 year, he wasn't as productive the year after Josh Allen because Josh Allen took up so much oxygen. So uh, there's a lot of reasons to be ex- – it's that, that run defense next year is going to be exciting. Uh, but that that's going to be a lot of the offseason. It's figuring out the pass defense. Then on offense, it's being more efficient in the run game. And, hey, Brock Vandegrift, please be good. Please. Just – Yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of everything is on – Please be good, uh, Brian. <laughs> but I think Cohen, I think he's shown enough for me to believe that they'll probably get some good quarterback play from Vandegrift. Uh, I, I've mentioned this all the time, Nick. Like these highly ranked guys that come out, a lot of times they just need a change of scenery. Um, we, we've seen it play over and over in the transfer portal era. I think Vandegrift's another one. Like you could easily sell yourself into, well, he just couldn't play because he had. Uh, the greatest Georgia quarterback of all time, and then a first rounder ahead of him, mm-hmm. and so now he can come over and get a chance to play, and he can do some things I think athletically and both throwing wise that I think Kentucky will like, and it'll be similar to Levis from a raw talent aspect in a few ways where Leary wasn't necessarily like well, Leary was well, maxed out where I think. Vandegrift is not. He's still got a ways to grow, and I think that'll be a good fit, I think, for Cohen in Kentucky. Well, look at the quarterbacks who are at the Heisman Trophy ceremony, all transfers. The quarterbacks in the yeah. playoff games. <laughs> like, you know, everyone, uh, but everyone but Penix, too, had. A blue chip, yeah. Yeah, was a highly ranked player. You look at Knicks and Jay Daniels. Which, by the way, what's. Let's talk about the playoff. Um, Luckett, I hope you um, had some access to wagering. I know Florida's weird. I was just feeling blessed to have the FanDuel Sportsbook because uh, bowl season was kind to me. I didn't have strong feelings about the nightcap, but the anytime touchdown, and the, the, the prop bets that you get in the Commonwealth and the Kentucky on the FanDuel Sportsbook app, uh, that was the first time I'd ever hit a first touchdown bet, so shout out Dylan Johnson for punching that one in. Um, I, I was a Roma Dunze touchdown away from having another three to one parlay hit. Um, had a couple other uh, Adonai Mitchell getting in there late was was very profitable for me as well. So um, the the playoff action was kind to me because I was playing along. With the FanDuel Sportsbook app, America's number one sportsbook, where new year, new promo, five dollars gets you a hundred fifty dollar bonus bet. Like that, that's all you got to do. You don't even have to win the bet. You don't have to make a winning money line wager. Just make that initial wager and go ahead and watch the, the bonus bucks fly in. You can win big with FanDuel this season. Just. Download it now, put in promo code PIGSKIN, and hop in on that action now. New customers are getting 150 in bonus bets. Guaranteed, just got to place that $5 bet. 150 in bonus bets, win or lose. Just got to be 21 in President Kentucky. It's your first online real money wager only. The $5 pregame wager is required. $10 deposit required. Bonus issued is non withdrawable. Bonus bets expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. And like it, my only regret, regret with bowl season is that it happens so fast and there's so much going on is that I can't can't share my picks as readily, right? And I, I haven't gone back and calculated, but I was definitely hitting it like a 70% clip. I just felt like the man on fire. Even on the way home, I didn't think I had any action in the Music City Bowl. And all of a sudden, boom, under hits for Auburn. And I was just like, oh, there's a winning bet. Like, I didn't know I even had it in there. It was a real, it was a real treat this bowl season, uh, playing along with our friends at FanDuel. Just ah, so so many winners all over the place. Yeah, I mean, it just with the portal and high school recruiting, you can't. It's hard to really dig into it. Like yeah, it's, it's we all, could have in the past. Right, it's a lot of it's a lot of feel too. Right, you know, Kansas State they like pop tarts, so give me the strawberry pop tarts at Kansas State. That was a nice cover. Um, some some nice sweat outs there. Some nice um, 
I, I was not happy with the Sunday night football result because I got the the total at a weird time. So the guy I was with, he hit the over. I missed it by a half point. It's just you know that's gambling. Um, but we were both we both liked Texas and Alabama, and neither of us got it right. I I, I think a lot of that Michigan game, you got to give credit to Harbaugh for going forward on that fourth down. They Michigan should have been beating the snot out of Alabama in the first half. Alabama hung around, and then. It's kind of the opposite in the second half where Alabama outplayed him, but Michigan hung around. And that fourth down call, to get that guy that wide open, a lot better fourth down call than the one Bama called in overtime for Jalen Milrow. Yeah, I think I think Michigan had the better year, had the better team. They won the game. I don't really have much more of a takeaway than that. I think it's going to be maybe a long offseason for Tommy Reese and Eric Wolford. Uh, they're in Tuscaloosa. Uh, yeah. Because they got they got bullied up front, which is not necessarily a surprise for Michigan's front, but um, a lot of free runners uh, for Michigan when that probably shouldn't happen. Uh, and then I think especially in the first half, the point you were, you made on Twitter, where it's like, what, why are you all going five wide against this Michigan front? Yeah, <laughs> like, what, what's going on here? Yeah, they definitely was. They definitely needed to help Milrow out. I think Milrow, the moment was too big. Like it looked too big for him. Like he kept slipping on the turf when he was getting out in the open field. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, why did that happen? I don't know. Maybe it was because the pass rush had him rattled. And I think Bama. They were just. They were. That just wasn't a. That wasn't the same Bama team. Um, and I kind of said it, and I got you know. I got some crap for it because they got hot as soon as I said, you know, going to the Kentucky game that this wasn't like this wasn't a national championship Bama team. Now they almost won the name national championship, mm-hmm. um, but but I, you know, you look back and it's just like, well, they, maybe Damon Georgia played best of six. Maybe that was the one they win. Do they force a game six? Maybe who knows? That was that just a one game scenario. They got Georgia, um, but yeah, I think you just have to hand it to Michigan and they won. They beat them the way you typically don't see Nick Saban teams get beat, mm-hmm. which is just, you know, a game in the trenches, and they just outlasted them um, there. And I think you make a good point. I think the creative offensive calls, now there were some like the the power toss to the uh, the flea flicker. I don't know why you would run two tosses right there. That was a little questionable to me, but there were some other things where I thought they did really well. And they won the game, so you have to tip their hat there. But I, I think Alabama, that was a flawed Alabama team, man. I mean, it was all year. They just got hot. And then I think I think, I think, think the SEC was the best conference still, Nick, but I think you could make the case that it wasn't what it normally was this year. I think looking back at it, LSU's defense was atrocious. That Georgia team was not – that Georgia team was still really good, but I don't think they were as good as the previous two teams. Alabama wasn't a typical many, Alabama, right? Yeah, right. just but that that kind of year happens sometimes, and now now we're gonna get a Big Ten, Big Ten national championship. So my assessment moving forward, though, from that game is can can JJ McCarthy win a national championship? Right? Like, is Michigan good enough up front? Is Blake Corum talented enough to be I able to look- consistently score against Washington? Yeah, I kind of look at it as Ohio State, Cardell Jones. Um, I need to dig into it more. But that game kind of has the 2014 Ohio State versus Oregon feel to me. Well, uh, it, which is fair, but also the game that Michael Penix played, my, mine's like, can he do that again, right? Because the way they were able to move the ball down the yeah, field, it was Michigan is going to make his – He's they're going to get his ass on the grass. And so, how does he play taking hits? I think Penix was awesome because he was able to play in a muddy pocket and avoid pressure. And, but that was really a game. Texas could not get him on the ground. I think Michigan is going to get him on the ground. Uh, and then I think Michigan's run game is going to cause Washington some more problems than Texas did. But I thought Texas would bully Washington in the trenches. That really didn't happen. I really think yeah. Michigan will be able to bully them in the trenches. So, and then I think Washington they got some fumble luck too in that game uh, with those two fumbles there in the second half by Texas. If they don't get those, Texas probably scores on those drives. But you have to give them credit. Thing for me with Washington, first five six weeks of the season they were awesome. They were legit mm-hmm. top two or three team. They play Oregon in that thriller. I think was 
towards the end of October. And then from that point until the end of the regular season, five games or whatever, they just didn't look that great. They looked like a 20, 20, top 20, top 22 team. They were barely getting by. Offense would go through lulls. And then they've hit another gear here against Oregon and the Pac-12 championship and then against Texas. Uh, Are they able to stay on that gear? Or is that – is that gonna? Are they gonna regress a little bit? Uh, but it, all signs point to this being Michigan's year. So, yeah, um, yeah. With I expect Connor Stallions at the Rose Bowl. That was hilarious. Um, yeah, I, I will be cheering for wa- Washington um, because they are fun and they're a great story. Um, Washington it, too, I think, shows if you're. Now it's gonna be it's gonna be harder for a team like that to get the national championship. I think in this new right, format. Right. But it shows if you get the generational quarterback mm-hmm. and you build it around him and you catch some breaks. Washington caught some breaks here with the, the Kalen DeBoer hire and then these receivers they have. They just yeah, had, they're awesome. You know, they just See, had that, awesome that, receivers. That is the one thing, though, like about this game is like I don't – I mean, they have a clear advantage in skill talent, right? Like it is – and how many times in this sport – can you have a, such a decisive advantage in skill talent and get beat? That that's the only part that's like going to, you know, is <laughs> does does it turn into a line of scrimmage game or does it turn into, yeah, we've got superstar quarterback game. I mean, that's really right um, which, to me, and I, that's why I compared it to that Oregon Ohio State game because that's what that matchup was. It was like, yeah. oh, Ohio State, they don't have. The court, like Oregon's got the quarterback, they're going to be able to score. Uh, but it became a it just became a trench warfare game in Ohio State. Just, just fed yeah. him. Yeah. The uh, one thing but I know like, that is, I can see Blake Corum. That might be the alt line, like over two hundred rush yards. Yeah, multiple rushing yeah. touchdowns. It's minus yeah. three seventy for any time touchdown for Blake Corum, which is crazy. Um, I uh, if there's one take that is rings true for all of this though. Why in the hell are they playing a national championship game in Houston? What? What? It's a great point. What? 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 what, what why? There's no you. There's no reason why this game should be played at that stadium in Houston. Maybe if you want to do something fun and go to SoFi, or you want to go to Vegas, sure. But like this is college football. Play it at a college football stadium, or play it like. I, can we not just do the national championship at the Rose Bowl? Can we not do even the Superdome? It's the Sugar Bowl. It's a bunch of you got boobs out on Bourbon Street. Like that's college football, right? Like I'm, I, I can, I can get behind that. I don't even the Cotton Bowl being played at Jerry World. Like it's something that's familiar. It's what we do. Why are we playing this game in Houston? It's so stupid. I'm gonna hate it. I hated all the commercials. I couldn't stay awake to watch the end of the Sugar Bowl because they didn't kick it off till 9 p.m. It used to be eight. It was four and eight. Why they decided to go five and nine this year? They're jerks. They're bastards. I think they lost three million viewers. Well, just because people fell asleep watching this game. They did that because it's not New Year's Eve. Because it was on New Year's Eve those years, so they want to get it done before midnight. Yeah, well, this year they, they don't care about it because it's not I on mean, New Year's Eve. It's it's just frustrating as hell. Rose Bowl can still get its sunset in the fourth quarter if you're starting the game at four. Like it, you know, it it just. Uh, and the other part of it too, there is a little red zone in my brain that I'm not used to as many commercials. But like it was, it was bad there. And like waiting around for the halftime, it's like this is eleven. This is eleven o'clock, and I know that I'm old and washed. But like we had, everybody went back to work on January second. It's not like it's not like people had the day off, you know. Um, so I, when Washington got the the fumble and they were up ten, I was like, all right, I can. I can roll over. I can fall. I can turn my brain off if I need to. Woke up. They 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 were getting it done. Have you so. have you seen if ESPN has announced of like the cast schedule? Because uh, they used to do the they used to do the coaches would all get in a room. They would have like eight of them, and I used to watch that. I would go yeah. back and watch that whole thing. I don't think I think they stopped doing it last year. So I wonder if they're doing that this year. They didn't for the title, and that would have been. Very funny because Georgia was just up by a million points against TCU. Yeah. That would have been hilarious to see the like what are those coaches going to do. So yeah, I don't know. I know they'll they'll definitely have like McAfee and his crew. They had uh, a on, on the field. on another yeah. one. Yeah, but I don't I don't know what the uh, 
the alts are going to be. Um, but it does suck. It's the, the final game of the year is almost here. Um, I just, I hate it. Because bowl, bowl season was a lot of fun this year. Like We had some, yeah. some crazy games. Like you mentioned earlier, it does hit you like, you know, you're like depressed for a little bit. You're like, oh, another season gone. God, I'm it's getting five so o'clock old. on a Wednesday. Why aren't we playing football right now? Right? Yeah. Why isn't a coach it's getting just, mayo dumped on it, it? Well, it's just another. How did this season go by so fast? Um, it's looking ahead to you know, like these. Like it's just kind of a, it is a dead period for football the next few weeks. Um, so well, it is, and even then you're like, sad, what am I looking forward but, to in basketball? Right? Like it's like. All right, SEC tournaments in two months. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now it'll it'll get better once we get the conference play where there's a midweek game and then a Saturday. But we were going eight days without a basketball game, and I don't know, it's just cold and ah, it sucks. It sucks. But mm-hmm. we'll get through it. Yes. We're gonna have plenty of time to dissect this season that was. Look ahead to the future. Um, there's a transfer portal visit happening this weekend. Look at Xavier Bosley. I haven't been able to look into him much other than I just see his height and weight listed, and I'm like, that's that's a guard. That's not a tackle. Like, he's like 6'4", 260 or something. I'm like, what? This can't be. These, these got to be off. Um, but he's from West Virginia, also visiting Pitt and West Virginia. Um, there's some corners out that out, out there. I don't my, – my, my thought is that, look, at if they don't hit anybody now, then there's another window. And no, there's, there's going to be a spring window. Um, it, Kentucky's it had more success big... in that spring window than they've had in this one. Like, you got Keyshawn it, Silver last year, but for the most part, the spring window feels like it'll be more lucrative. Yeah, it won't be as big as the first one, though, but it'll be bigger than this one that we're currently in. Uh, and so we'll have to, we'll just need to see where they're at. I mean, there's going to be a lot, I think, in both players and coaches, just figuring out where, you, like, for a player, where you are on the depth chart. Do you need to leave? Uh, see DeAndre Buford and David Wollaball last year. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and then for coaches, it's going to be like, where are we? Where do we need some more help at? I think it, you know, you look at corner last year. I think they probably came to a final conclusion in the spring that Harrison was their guy at corner. Um, and so that can go both ways. You can feel good about his position, or you can feel bad. So we'll just have to see where where they stand. Yep. Um, but. You got to get to spring ball, but that's that's another ways away. We'll have plenty of coverage here on the KSR YouTube channel, KSR Plus, all the places you've been hitting refresh over the last few weeks. Might slow down ever so slightly because um, it is the off season, uh, but we'll still be. This is where we get to have some fun. Like it, we get to have our coaching carousel podcast. Feels like that was mm-hmm. a, an eternity ago. Just a lot of stuff. We're going to be playing catch up over the next month. We appreciated y'all joining us for the entire 2023 Kentucky football season. It was a blast, and we're not slowing down anytime soon. For Adam Luckett, I'm Nick Roush. Go Cats and go Kroger.